as a compliment, um, you just like take a deeper dive and like learn about the Bible and Jesus. And does anyone know what it is to be a Christian? Well, it's like to be like an extension of Jesus and to act like him and help others that are in need. And can I do you name one thing that Jesus did? I think it's not hard. Right. Well, didn't you learn about when Jesus fed the 40,000 or that? Well, Jesus like helped those in need and went around and fed the hungry. And as a compliment, you have to do a project like ranging from anything to dance shows or like helping orphans. And my project was uh, to feed the homeless at Tony's Kitchen. And you know, it made me feel great that I helped others, but it made me realize that there are so many in need that need help. And can you tell me one thing that you did to help others and tell me how it made you feel? Help you. Great. Can anyone else name one thing? We thank you for our blessings, our friends, our family today, and a brighter future. I'll be reading from the Psalms today. I lift my eyes to the hill. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. God will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. This is a reading from the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one had heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Crene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So our confirmants have been uh, leading worship thus far, and I feel like we haven't missed a beat. I'm getting a little nervous about my job security at the moment. <laughs> uh, I was in school at a United Methodist institution uh, 16 years ago is when I first attended Every four years, United Methodists engage in a general conference. And so in the year 2000, the S word was slowly appearing on the lips of some of my peers. Sixteen years later, and nobody is pretending anymore, the S word is being 
spoken out loud. Schism. Schism's not a word I hear much outside of the church, but with those with ears to hear, it's heard far and wide across Protestantism these days. A schism is the formal separation of a church or a denomination into two parties. United Methodists are now trying to work out whether they should indeed split and do so with charity and grace or if they should stay together. Now it is easy for someone who never ended up becoming a United Methodist elder, never became a member of a United Methodist church to sit and think smugly, look at me, I, I didn't follow down that road, we're so different from them. But the United Methodists are not going through a United Methodist problem, they're going through a people problem. The value of reaching across the aisle, we all know, is a lost art these days. On the one hand, and on the other, we also acknowledge that in 2016 we have come to a place in our culture where at least at times we know that the disenfranchised will no longer wait. This is not a commentary on the ability of people to negotiate in this day and age, but a statement that rings true across our country. The disenfranchised increasingly will not wait to be recognized with dignity and full inclusion. This is at the core of the United Methodist debate, or at least this is the canvas upon which their debates are being painted. A classmate of mine at my United Methodist Seminary is a man named Gregory Gross, who is an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. He wrote a letter to the, uh, to the Council of Bishops the other day before General Conference started, and the tone of his letter was essentially this. You know, I was born a United Methodist. I was raised a United Methodist. In fact, I have poured my entire life into this church. And now as a deacon, I have walked with them while they are dying. I have officiated at their weddings. I have walked the walk. And the church still will not recognize me for who I am to counter the movement towards full inclusion and recognition, a more traditional network of Methodists called the Good News Network has suggested that LGBTQ supporters are playing a, quote, zero-sum game, which leaves little room for negotiation. In fact, negotiation is near impossible at this point in the United Methodist framework which, to my mind, might be a valid point if we could actually negotiate or wanted to negotiate which parts of Gregory's humanity and dignity ought to be included and recognized. So our denomination's response has been somewhat predictable. From our national officers, another letter was written. We're very good at writing letters these days, aren't we? A letter was written, part of which read, Thanks be to God for the testimonies present in both texts and time, reminding us of our past struggles to see and hear God clearly. We witness in biblical stories, conversations that reflect the challenge of the early church to embrace the inclusiveness of Gentiles. We witness through the history of race and the church a complex journey toward understanding the image of God imbued in varying hues. It's only been during the 20th century that preaching women were affirmed through ordination in many denominations. What seemed to be a theological impasse has now been overcome not only with ordination, but within several denominations, including the United Methodist Church. We have lived to witness women elevated to the episcopacy. This is happening while at the same time the Pope has at least suggested that we might have a conversation about female deacons in the Roman Catholic Church. And all of this strikes me as a continuing 
tone deafness within the church to our broader culture. One in three people who were under the age of 35 and now not connected to any religious tradition but were raised in one state that it is the church's treatment of gay and lesbian people that has primarily contributed to their departure. One third of people who have left the church under the age of 35 are saying that is their primary cause for departure. And to be sure, there is no one reason why someone would ever leave the church. Other factors that make popular American Christianity off-putting would surely include our hypocrisy at times, music, not here of course, but music that people don't enjoy or relate to. Those are the blinkers, right? Not here, of course. (laughs) A great deal of disrespect toward other world religions. Not enough visibility with regard to our work for and with those enduring poverty, reducing social injustice. There's not enough emphasis on compassion, on following the way, the teachings and the example of Jesus. It may be easier to say and feel better to say, I left the church to stand in solidarity with my friends rather than saying that the preacher talks too much or the music isn't what I like. But, but are we, are we listening? In our Confirmand's faith statements, there were a number of echoes present that asked an essential question. Are people in the church still really having these arguments? Grace Carlin was the most direct example. Sorry for putting on this bugger. Yes, I know, I'm sorry. Uh, I just would like to point people towards your faith statement, which is, in early part, a large question mark. Really? Church? You seem to be saying, God, I can, I can talk about God. But really, church? Can the church still be this way? We learn from the book of Acts that those who have been blessed by the Holy Spirit will always seem a little off, as if they might have had some wine early in the morning, according to those first onlookers. Indeed, it's clear enough that those who have a sense of the Spirit in the Acts 2 context may not be aware that anything is particularly off. Everything seems okay with them, but it's those who are observing at a distance who seem to feel as though the disciples are not quite there, that there is an effect that is is something like a, a bubble happening, a bit of a bubble. This morning, folks, I just want to say, thank God for my bubble. I do understand that bubbles pop. The bubbles blow away. Confirmands, we want you to know that we give thanks for you and also want to acknowledge that you, too, are in something of a bubble. We say this because we never want you to confuse the church for God and God for the church because we do actually know that they aren't the same thing. And at the same time, we want you to know that may you, as you grow, also come to know that when we have tried to show you what church was all about, we have spent less time squabbling about matters of inclusion and more time, at least in the last year, fretting about how many people we have helped. May you know that we didn't spend any time arguing about whether you might someday be good enough or respectable enough, or quite frankly, straight enough to serve the church. And instead, we have prayed that we have taught you enough about the life of Jesus for you to fall madly in love with the story as some of us have. May you also know that we never taught you to say the right prayer or one prayer or to do one thing in particular to get yourself saved. But instead, we tried to remember that we are just a part of your journey. And that you also are a part of mine and ours. That we all are teaching each other and learning from each other, offering care and dignity to each other. It's just as clear in Acts 2 that the words of the prophet Joel, now echoed by Peter, are about intergenerational dreaming and visioning. 
A key indicator, not just that the Spirit rests with those who are of a working age or of a certain maturity, but also those who regularly have a say also have the capacity to listen to those dreams and visions that come from young and old. The Acts 2 story is that that both young and old are capable of not just speaking of dreams and visions, but also of being heard. I hope in confirmation classes and in your time with your mentors, you have felt heard, but much more than that, you have felt listened to, that you have felt validated, that you have felt respected. Because we honor you. We honor your journey. We honor our own little bubble where you have a voice. And as members of the church, you have a free and full voice to guide the life of the community along with every other adult member. Some of you, we have had a chance to grow with you for quite a while now and Betsy is working her way over to the projector and we do just want to show you real quick just how long we have been growing with you for quite a while now if you could go to the first picture there Betsy there is David Wallace is in the back row there's Grace and Maddie and Natalie the next slide we have second grade Miles Cherry Has there ever been a better picture of Miles Cherry? (laughs) My goodness. Maddie and Caitlin and Natalie and Declan and Grace. And then we get some individual shots. There's Natalie. Oh, Natalie. (laughs) David and Caitlin. (laughs) Confirmands. We honor your gifts, your intelligence, and your creativity. David, thank you for welcoming us today. Natalie, for your call to recognize the peace of God among us. For Declan, your moment with the children. Hey, man, I get it. Sometimes they don't want to talk. I've been there. And your insistence on prayer. Maddie, your call to worship and your upcoming benediction, which will grant us peace for our journey. Caitlin and Miles, for your readings of the scripture and for the gifts that God has given all of you. And so to help us celebrate those gifts from God, Grace and Katie, Grace and Katie, take us to another place as we celebrate your gifts and God's gifts that surround us this morning. on the land, but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. He sends the snow in winter, the warmth to swell the grain, the breezes and the sunshine, the soft refreshing and good the seed time and the harvest our life our health our food no gifts we have to offer for all things bright and good which thou desirest our humble thankful
to invite the ushers forward to receive the offering, and may we give generously to God, who has been so generous to us.